Hey, how's it going? Hey, I'm doing well. How are you? Hey, man, doing all right. Glad to be on for another OTXNT. Been a couple of weeks, so here we are. Um, we're just going to cut to the chase. Today, we're talking about babies and baby making. And um, so this kind of uh, is going to be, I think it's timely. There's a lot of stuff going on, a lot of articles, things like that, that I know that you and I are going to talk through. But uh, this, some of this stuff came from me just preaching through Exodus recently. I have some insights, some things I'd like to share. I know that you and I want to kind of bounce off each other. So you want to you want to talk about it today? Yeah, let's talk about babies and making making them, making lots of them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sounds good. Uh, let's go ahead and pray and give. Uh, hopefully, God will give us wisdom as we navigate this issue because it can be a little tricky. Yeah, um, join me in the Lord's prayer, if you will. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. All right. So you, I think, were the one who actually brought this topic up. To set it up, I know that's something kind of... Uh, you and I have, I guess, in, in all of our years, we get this question, right, about family size, things like that. I think, um, you know, it, it's irrelevant. But in, in our culture today, there's a lot of questions about fertility. There's a lot of questions about birth rates. There's a lot of questions about family size still. Um, so I, uh, here's here's how I would like to start. This is something, Andrew, so... Um, you know, I've been preaching through Exodus and I got to, you know, as I started with Exodus one, I thought it was quite interesting when you go into the story and you look at this, you, you see the whole setup of like life has become bitter. Israel is in slavery. You see that in the first, um, first few verses, but here's what's interesting, right? So verse seven of chapter, uh, one says, uh, but the sons of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly and multiplied and became exceedingly mighty so that the land was filled with them. And that also pulls from the imagery of Genesis chapter one of uh, this kind of surge of life that's coming. Uh, but then it goes on, right? And, uh, you know, the Pharaoh begins to get worried about the people growing, being too many. Um, and so it says, uh, like, I love this idea, like verse 12, right? Exodus one, but the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and the more they spread out so that they were in dread of the sons of Israel. And this is something I thought was really peculiar about the passage, because once you read that line and then you realize the other piece, which is then you get into the Hebrew midwives story and the rest of that one, and notice what God does for them. He blesses them and gives them houses of their own and allows them to have children. It's a fascinating story in that chapter one is setting up that Israel's being oppressed, but God is thwarting the plans. Um, but notice what he's doing. He is he is thwarting the plans uh, by increasing Israel. So there's some major implications to this passage. Major implication one is uh, that God had always planned that he was going to increase the size of Israel. Um, but major implication two is that children are a blessing from the Lord. I mean, I, I, could you imagine what's happening in this story? And it's like these guys are having their lives are bitter. They're being whipped. They're being forced to do heavy labor. And then they come home and you find out, hey, we're expecting, right? Uh, that that image, and that's looked at as a blessing. Like the text is showing us like, <clears throat> look what God has done. It's an incredible thing. If we were writing this today— it would have been, and you know, God gave them rest and entertainment, you know, and they, it was, it was, but you know, it didn't feel much at all. Like hardly would we ever say children. In fact, if it was written today, it would be, they had children. And that's why their lives were afflicted and burdened. It's like, that's no, that's not how this is played. So the, the affliction happens and they're blessed with children. All right. Throw it out to you. First thoughts as you kind of think through it. Yeah. You know, it, it is. It's really troubling uh, the the way our culture views kids, uh, and uh, it's uh, really kind of sad because, yeah, the biblical worldview is 
always positive about kids. It, it's never negative about kids to, to my knowledge. Uh, and we have reduced children in our society to a, a financial obligation and uh, a, a in, inhibitor on a, a woman's career. Uh, and you know the idea about being pregnant uh, is a woman will never be equal to a man unless she's equally uh, able or able to be equally unpregnant at any time. Uh, so that's why abortion is necessary. So we, we have this kind of uh, war on children and uh, you know, the culture of death that we've had with the extermination of 60 million children in the womb. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a pretty terrible place that we find ourselves today. But what bothers me is that in the evangelical world and the Christian world, there seems to also be a, a strong uh, negative view of large families, of not having too many kids, not having kids too soon. Uh, and uh, we have let this worldly thinking of children being a financial uh, obligation rather than a blessing of the Lord uh, to uh, make uh, major inroads into how we think. Uh, and I don't think we think biblically. Uh, not that you can't uh, take precautions and that you can't space things out and you can't uh, you know, do any number of things. But the, the reality is the disposition of having children should be a positive one and always a positive one in the church. Uh, and uh, and it's something that really does bother me because you can't read the Old Testament without saying, uh, what's going on? I mean, look at Rachel and Leah and the children war that they're having. Yeah. How many can we have? And of course, the, the laughing stock of the whole family is poor Rachel because God has not opened her womb. And uh, finally, he opens her womb. He blesses her and we have uh, Joseph and then Benjamin. Uh, until that happened, she felt like she was deficient and uh, she was treated that way, uh, which of course is is wrong. And that's not necessarily the, 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 a good lesson to learn that we should treat people who are barren negatively. But the desire was children and uh, the children were celebrated. You know, it, nobody was sad that there were 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, you know, oh, shucks, we should have just had seven. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, yeah the, these are the things that... It, it, it's one of those deals, you know, you approach the the, the Bible and you kind of have a certain set of understandings uh, that you've been brought up with. And if the church doesn't teach on certain things, you end up adopting the world's view because that is what you inherit. And, you know, I know a lot of people are like, I, I changed my view theologically on the end times, or I changed my view theologically on predestination. Um, I think a lot of people ought to be changing their view to some degree on children. Yeah. And, uh, and it really flows from a reading of the text. Uh, you, you have to kind of silence the text in your own mind and in your own spirit, not to see that God, uh, God considers this a great blessing. Um, so um, yeah, I'll kick it back to you. Yeah. Well, I think you're absolutely right. I think this is one of those areas that we don't often think through, right? We don't think about, um, about the value of children. We don't think we're never, we just do what was told to us. Right. So um, we, we're, we're told don't have a bunch of kids cause it's super expensive. Okay. Um, yet, right. That's there. We're told in Psalm 127 that they're, they're a heritage, they're a blessing. Right. And, uh, and so we, we need to be willing to trust God on some of this stuff. I think sometimes we think here's what it's going to be. Here's how it, how it is. And we don't just trust that God has got it. If he says it's a blessing, to let it go. Here's another thing I think it's important, right? Is look at, yeah, absolutely. Look at the way that the Bible views children, the value of children um, in, in the, throughout the text. Uh, but, but also recognize, I think people begin to think like, well, like uh, you know, what about, you know, or, or I guess what we're saying is because this, this eventually will get into the whole uh, birth control conversation, right? And this conversation of birth control has gone on for centuries upon centuries about, you know, how that, how that is to be done, what that's all about. But, but one thing I think we need to, to get to is, I think, let's talk about the number at this point. There is no biblical number that says, here's what it looks like to have, you know, you know, at some point, here's what it looks like to have this amount of kids. This is what a full family looks like. I mean, even in Psalm 127, when he says in verse three, he says, sons are indeed a heritage from the Lord, offspring a reward, like arrows in the hand of a warrior. So are the sons born in one's youth. How happy is a man who has his quiver, who has filled his quiver with them. They'll never be put to shame when they speak with their enemies at the city gate. He doesn't tell us what it, what a quiver looks like. And so I think there's some things to keep in mind that uh, that there it's a good thing to have a full quiver. We don't know what that number is. Here's another thing that we have to recognize is, um, you know, that 
children should be wanted. We should be valuing them. I think not only from the standpoint of families should want children, um, but church should be celebrating children and, it, you know, celebrating and supporting people to have more children. Um, but one thing I think is important to have in this discussion is really looking at this. If, in fact, they are a blessing from the Lord, then I think there's some major implications for us. Um, and who are we to say no more blessings? I, I yeah, we don't I, I think, think about that. that. That's really, and, and I think is it Vody Bakum who said it? He's like, that's the one blessing that we say, don't give me any more of. Uh, I, I haven't heard that, but it doesn't surprise I'm pretty me. Pretty sure it's Vody. It comes from Vody, um, and it is something you know. Uh, you know, like you said, the, the birth control question goes back centuries. Uh, of course, it, it only goes back really um, until the 1900s, uh, where you had a very pragmatic, very effective form of birth control that was uh, really at the lady's discretion. And yeah. that is something that really was revolutionary. And if you study uh, denominational uh, views on this, everybody was against it, uh, Protestants and Catholics alike, until uh, the pill emerged. Uh, and so then there was a huge change. And unfortunately, that shift uh, led to kind of the Protestant evangelical world being uh, really unprepared for the abortion debate. Uh, so that that's something, you know, we, we can go, go down in a separate video. Uh, but the reality is there are certain things that... Uh, have been under discussion. And the reason that this was uh, viewed basically negative by the whole uh, church history was that children were a blessing. And how are we as religious leaders instructing people to deny God's blessings? Uh, and uh, and while we need to bear in mind that we do have Timothy um, 5.8, but if any provide not for his own and specifically for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Uh, there, there is the idea of I, I may try to uh, put myself in a financial situation where I can take care of the children. But I don't think that this was a birth control passage uh, or a limit yeah. your children passage. This was a passage about people being lazy and not getting after it, uh, men not working. That's a whole and, other uh, video that we, yeah, we were talking um, about. Buying yourself a toy rather than going ahead and, and suffering for your family like Christ does for his, the church. So yeah, um, it, it could play into a, a theology of this. But I, I think it's really important as a church that we recognize that God has declared that children are a blessing. A pregnancy in the church is a blessing. Even a pregnancy that is uh, out of wedlock, the pregnancy is a decision of God to open a womb. And so we would, in that situation, maybe uh, not celebrate the uh, way that this baby came into the world, but we're going to celebrate this baby. Yeah. Uh, because God has not made a mistake. And, you know, the idea of like, uh, oh, you're our mistake, your favorite mistake, that kind of language is not, it's not a helpful language. It, it feeds into this kind of, uh, you're we our didn't oops, you. baby. Yeah. yeah. Um, shame, shameful. Never, never tell that to a child because God doesn't have an oops baby. It doesn't exist. Uh, so, um, yeah, I, I think if we could get this right, uh, and we could say uh, a large family is always a blessing from the Lord. You know, don't, don't look at the Duggars and despise them because they have a lot of kids. Uh, you know, that I, I know a lot of people who do. I'm not saying that that's how everyone should live their life, but that's a blessing according yeah. to scripture, right? Yeah, and exactly. I always think- Most of the time in church, you, you people ridicule, even in the church, yes. ridicule people. Yeah, yeah, like, and they'll say yourself. things. Don't yes. they know how to use birth control, right? You'll hear that from church people. Yeah. And uh, that, yeah, so tell me- um, the Israelites who were in slavery and destitute in their livelihoods um, were being blessed with more kids, right? Uh, God didn't seem to be as worried about the fact that you were financially unable. Uh, he recognized that the value uh, long-term of the nation was dependent upon uh, lots of children. And so that's what he did. Uh, one of the things that I think is important is the story of Jehoahaz and Elisha. And Elisha tells the king, you know, shoot your arrows. Every arrow is an arrow of victory. And he shoots th three arrows and he's uh, rebuked because... Why didn't you shoot more arrows? You should have shot a whole quiverful. And I, I think if you're trying to find a biblical explanation of a uh, number, well, three was uh, not enough to defeat the enemy uh, when God promised blessing. So, uh, you know, the, the idea, insight. Yeah, the, the disposition, the right? Adam had three kids, right? Three, three boys, uh, probably daughters. Uh, we don't know the number and maybe more sons. Uh, Noah, three boys, right? So, so I'm not saying if you don't have more kids than that, you've failed. But the idea is if someone does have a lot more than three, like eight to 10 or 12, um, God bless them. What a wonderful blessing. It should be celebrated. And I really wish that uh, pastors would be a little bit more bold to say this from the pulpit, because there's young ladies 
that would like to have children who are actually being trained not to as, as children um, by people who have a bad doctrine of this and where women should be teaching the younger women. A lot of the older women are training the younger women to despise a blessing of a large family. And that's not a, that's not a, a biblical place and it needs to be corrected from the pulpit. Not everybody is required to have a big family. Not everybody can have kids, but never should we look uh, disdainfully at someone who has a, a large family. Um, that that is something that is just uh, it's it's secular. It's not scriptural. So you know, you bring up that piece. I think there's some interesting insights that you just brought out. Like, look at these people in the Bible too, and recognize that like there's different. Um, there's different uh, sizes of families. And let's venture to say that um, I think it's safe to say um, that for the most part, there was, uh, you know, no modern birth control that was being used by these people. Now, granted, in your dissertation, you had to deal with Onan uh, <laughs> and uh, and he practiced his own way. If you want to read that in the Genesis story. Uh, but but largely looking at this, like I don't get the sense that these people are all, you know, look, could they have? Sure, right? Uh, counted their days, you know, was it rhythm method or whatnot, right? Like, that's one thing. But, like, look at these people and recognize, like, like you're right. Noah has three sons. Okay, that's it? Now, uh, you know, look at some of these other people. And, like, they tap out at certain points, too. I know I was reading, um, I think it was Doug Wilson's book on family, and he brought that point up that like, like, you know, God, uh, it's not like, it's not like a game. It's not like a, a necessity that once you, if you just trust God with your family and say, Hey, give me a quiver and whatever you want me to have. Right. Uh, that like, you're going to end up with the, uh, you know, 14 kids in County, right. Or 19 kids in County. Like, like it's different. Like even you brought up the, the Rachel and Leah story, right? Like, couple things to recognize. Verse 31 of chapter 29 of Genesis, the Lord saw that Leah was unloved and he opened her womb. That's important, right? So, because what the doctrine is teaching us is God is the one who opens, he closes, right? So it is, it's not a, if God wants you to have, if God's plan is for you to have kids, he will allow for you to have kids. It's not, well, well, well sex is biological, um, it, it is not a guarantee that once you, once you engage in it, that you're going to, uh, necessarily like if God's not planning for there to be that, then it's not going to happen. It's not just a guarantee that, you know, you're unprotected. You don't use birth. Your boom is going to happen. Then you look at the, the story a little bit more, right? And you go and you see that, uh, uh, there's this interesting line, verse 35, of Genesis 29 says she conceived again. She bore a son this time. I'll praise the Lord. She named him Judah. And then she stopped bearing, right? That's interesting because what it's showing is like, okay, at some point she taps out now it, she taps out, but then you go and you read a little bit more. Uh, once she realized verse nine, she stopped bearing in chapter 30. Then they start getting their maids involved. That becomes a whole mess. Right. Um, yeah. And then, uh, but it does look like, you know, that um, uh, you, you look at verse 17 of chapter 30, God gave heed to Leah and uh, con she conceived and bore Jacob a fifth son. So even though this is going on, it's like God is the one who is the one who is to bring it. And it's not just a guarantee that, that sometimes God makes it where you can't have kids. Sometimes God makes it to where you got a bunch of kids. Sometimes God taps you out after a certain amount. So I think it's just, it's, it's wise for us to teach that way as well, is that if we're going to truly trust God, that we need to be willing to just say, hey, God, I put this in your hands. I'm not going to tell you how many you know, I'm not going to say this is it. I've, I'm, this is my quiver. No, you give me the extent of your quiver. And it could be that God says your quiver's three. It could be that God says your yep. quiver is going to be a little bit bigger than that or less than that. But I, I, I get nervous that we have allowed, and not the Bible to speak into our views of family, family planning. We've allowed the world to, which is why we think about 
numbers. And I, last thing I'm going to say, I'm sorry, I've just been talking too much. You said something else too about your trips and your fun. I think one of the reasons why people say I can't afford it is because there's a lot more. We're not thinking of the future. We're not thinking of children being an arrow shooting out through the, towards the future. We're thinking about what do I want to do in my future with my trips and my fun. And if I have kids, I can't do those things anymore. Sorry, keep going. No, and I think I think it's a good point. And, and one of the things I think, you know, we we had this discussion, I don't know, uh, a long time ago. We've had it 20... for years, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I remember uh, talking about, you know, do we need to pay for our kids to go to college? And, you know, one of the major expenses of children is uh, I, you got to send them all to college. Uh, and, of course, you don't. <laughs> In fact, maybe yes. you'll keep your kids in the faith if you don't send them to college. That would be a fun discussion. Should you send your kids to college? Me representing a Christian university. Um, send them to Wayland, but uh, yes, the, the reality is college, um, <laughs> Wayland is the one. <laughs> but uh, the, the truth is that one of the things about our uh, American idea of you now go and find a job and you have no obligations to your parents and uh, everybody takes care of their own generation and you send your parents to a nursing home, uh, that's a foreign view from the biblical picture as well. And the idea that you would have lots of kids that they would help you with the land, they'd help you with the family business more or less. And uh, the result would be that they would be a great benefit and a, a great asset in the future. Uh, and of course, the, the, the extension of uh, your blessing and your name and all of that. But uh, some, something is wrong in the way that we're raising children so that we actually look at them purely uh, from an economic perspective. And that economic perspective somehow is negative. And, and this is one of those things where I, I do wonder if there should be more of an effort made to um, have a family business uh, have uh, some sort of understanding that that, that we're going to try to build something with our name, um, because, and of course, not everybody's going to do that. But the idea that we, the way we're doing it right now, has detached that generational obligation. Uh, I think it feeds into the way we do church, where we have the old people church and we have the young people church and we have the the kids church, and that way there's never any even uh, family unity going on in worship. Uh, we, we do a lot of things to separate the generations so that that arrow can never serve the one that's firing it. And I think that's a that's a big piece. I think of why uh, children are not looked at positively, um, and that's not a biblical view. Uh, the other thing is, if you look at kind of how things did go before uh, uh, birth control, uh, women often would be having children. By the time that they were no longer having children, uh, they would then be having grandkids. And so the idea of a woman working in the home and uh, discipling uh, the young women in the home, you know, again, look at look at the Bible, uh, the, the, the expected vocational location of your wife is the home. Uh, so it doesn't mean she can't ever do anything outside the home. I'm just saying that this was the way uh, that, that the scripture understood things and uh, expected things to continue, at least for a long time. Um, but we have generations of people who didn't have children after the age of 28. Uh, now, of course, they're having them. They're trying to start in the age of 35 because they don't get married until they're 30. Uh, but you, you have a situation now where uh, women are looking for a secondary career. They're trying to, um, you know, fulfill a, a vocation uh, after parenting ended. And I think a net result of this, which is not a necessary, but it is something that I think happens is they're growing apart, husbands and wives, and you're seeing divorces take place in that empty nester syndrome. So it's a major mark of when divorce happens. Um, th this is just not typically a, a biblical view. And uh, I, I just, uh, we, we're doing things gr uh, significantly different. Than was the expectation and some of that's because we have developed as a society and uh, we, we have a lot of advantages that people didn't have back then so i'm not saying throw it all out but there's a, a time where you should face all of this and say well you know it, it, are we doing this right or are we doing it because the world does it this way and are we missing out on the blessings because you know i i had to get my job and you had to get your job and then we can't have a family. And by the time we have a family, uh, my wife can't have kids anymore. And 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 so we, we've done so many things that sabotage uh, the wonderful opportunity. And in my mind, ch children should be graduating high school wanting to start a family about as soon as possible. And they may not be able to right away, but they should be excited about getting married and having children and uh, mom needing to take care of those kids and dad needing to go work hard. Uh, this this is not revolutionary thinking, and this is not backwards thinking. This is biblical thinking. Yeah. And if that was to take place, yeah, you you would have uh, a lot of years where the the wife would be able to have lots of children, if the Lord decided. 
I know the Lord did not decide. That's not a chastisement. It's just a reality of God decides um, to open the womb or to close it. So you would bring up an interesting point too, because I think a lot of people would say, no, 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 I'm not looking at the world. What I'm doing is I'm just looking at what other Christians have done. And that's not sufficient either, right? I, I it, It's not sufficient to say, well, good godly Christians told me about this, um, and this is what their advice was. Like, okay, what about the Bible, though? Like, what does the Bible say? And I think that's where we've gotten into a lot of trouble. I think, largely speaking, Christians have unplugged and they take marriage on from a standpoint of what do, what do I see just other good Christians doing? Uh, they take on uh, decision-making that way. They take on make family that way. They're not looking and saying, what does the Bible say? They're saying, what, what do all the other Christians who have gone before me have said? And I think that you get into big trouble that way because I think there's been a lot of bad advice, um, you know, that uh, about kids and families and, uh, you know, don't do it until you're ready. And once you have it, it's not like, I mean, I just think even the way that we talk in church, I've said this so many times, my people know, like, you people just talk like don't don't have kids because it's going to be so difficult for you. When it, like like that's the, that's not helpful. Uh, we need to change that, and we need to say look at what the Bible teaches, and then be cool with that. A couple of things I want to say too is, I mean, this discussion right of why I, I think one of the reasons why you and I want to talk about this is because not only is this something that we have been seeing across the board, just discussions that we've had. I think especially with younger folks too of like you should want kids and should should. Uh, who trust God with that. But this is also connected to what we're seeing culturally take place in our world right now. Here's an article that says right here, Business Insider, this is actually from just a week ago. Uh, Americans aren't having enough kids. That's bad news for the economy and immigration may be the answer. So what they're showing is that our uh, we're dropping, right? It says uh, some of the world's largest economies are now grappling with a new problem for the first time. China, Japan, and Italy are battling dwindling birth rates. Their struggles are a reminder of the issue that could eventually become a problem for the U.S. Uh, China last year lost its crown as the world's most populous country to India, a record it held for almost 75 years. Uh, it's, uh, you know, we, we're we're shrinking. And this is something that's happening across the world is everybody can talks about this uh, overpopulation, we're losing generations now. Uh, and, uh, and, and we're losing tons and tons of people. And so, yeah, economically, the, our country starts to say, well, what do we do? And this is what you typically see in countries right now. They're recognizing that there's not enough people coming up to help support the next generation to support the economy. So what do they do? They either have to start paying people to start having kids you see that, and I think in Israel and Greece, I think some other yeah, European China's countries, mm -hmm. um, and then or you just do uh, is full blown immigration because the immigrants are having kids, um, and so like that's what's happening. So I think this is something to be said, and which ties to this. I don't know if if you you know I know you're not an NBC MSNBC person, but there was the the rounds that made recently it was the, the lady Joy Reid, and she was on MSNBC or she was made a clip of herself saying. Why do we need more kids in America? Uh, and she was trying to, as if she was trying to say that it was hypocritical for people to to say we don't need this flow of illegal immigration to the country when we have 365 billion uh, million people in our country and we've got these people. She thought it was hypocritical to say that we should be pro life and not supporting abortion. Uh, and we should, you know, and not especially she was uh, she was uh, frustrated with the Alabama ruling about uh, in vitro fertilization and saying that that's not consistent. Why not? You know, uh, if, if we don't if we want all of this, then why would you not want immigration? Um, and, and I don't think those are inconsistent positions to hold, um, you know, and uh, but it's, it's, it's an interesting time in our country where we're saying to our people uh, don't have kids restrict restrict uh and um and uh but we're fine with everybody else those people having kids culturally so anyways that stuff's happening too that so we have the falling birth rates of our nation uh that and the world there we're, we're seeing collapse take place or headed to that because there's no generations coming up um question for you the, the the commands to Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply in Genesis 1, mankind 
Do you see that as a command that's still in effect? Uh, yeah, and it's renewed uh, coming off the ark after Noah's sacrifice, I believe. God tells them to be fruitful and multiply, uh, fill the earth. Uh, so, um, yeah, and I think this is important in marriage counseling. Uh, one of the um, primary purposes in your marriage is to be fruitful and multiply. That That is what uh, why God is bringing you together ultimately uh, is, is not for your entertainment or for your uh, just a personal love for each other. Uh, he also is about new creation. And so it's not to the exclusion of your love for one another. Uh, and the fact that you'll be a lifelong commitment uh, reflecting God's covenant relationship with his church. Uh, so don't get me wrong. I'm not excluding that. But one of the primary things, what is God seeking in Malachi? Godly offspring. Godly offspring. And so we we know that God's purpose is uh, for um, for families uh, to form. And so uh, when I hear young people are like, I don't know if we want to have kids. Uh, the reality is a lot of people are, are playing with fire to some degree because they don't know the future and our fertility goes down with time. Uh, you know, ladies listening to me, I just want you to be aware that you're going to be less fertile 10 years from now than you are today. Uh, chances are. Uh, so the, the reality is that uh, by waiting and having your, your years of fun, you run the risk of not having a family. Uh, or having a much smaller family than than uh, God would like to bless you with, um, so I, I would suggest that um, you know I what I really think we need to do. And I saw somebody post this recently, so it's not original to me. But they were talking about how um, the in vitro discussion that the reality is very few people are infertile in their twenties. Very very few women are, uh, but in their thirties it starts to go up dramatically, and in the forties uh, tremendously. So uh, the need for uh, in vitro fertilization is largely due to women delaying marriage and delaying families because they've been told they have to go to college, get a graduate degree. And then if you've done all that, you need to work in your career for a few years. And by the time they get around to uh, realizing that they really wanted a family and they they bought it in a lie, 10 years have passed and, and they are having a hard time having children. Um, we, we need to make it okay for a young woman to say, what do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be a mommy. That's the greatest thing if God allows you to be a mommy, that's the greatest thing that you could be, uh, a wife and a mommy. You know, uh, And I know women get angry at me when I say such things because some women can't. Well, God has a, a special calling for you. You know, We can go to 1 Corinthians and, and we can talk about those that are called to be celibate, uh, are called you know, that God doesn't open their wombs. But the reality is the majority of us are called to be married and the majority of us are called to have children. So if we're going to do it, let's do it God's way. Uh, and let's do it in a way that we celebrate and we welcome that. And I'll have to say, honestly, I was afraid to have children. I was afraid to take the step. I was afraid to get married. I, I kind of bought into all of that. Oh, gosh. You know, um, but I look back and I, I was married by 23. So people look at me like I was I was a baby uh, at 23 getting married. Uh, but the reality is I thought I was uh, running out of time. And the clock has shifted so far back that people are, are 30 years old. I think 28 is the norm, the, the average right now. Um, yeah, it, part of the need for in vitro and other the other uh, technologies that are uh, designed to help people have children are due to the fact that we're uh, we're not living life according to the standard plan. We've created a false plan, and some of it, I, I think, a lot of it is driven by the feminist movement and the church is all gung ho. I mean, if you ask a young lady in the third grade right now what she wants to be when she grows up, she's going to give you a job, and. There was a time where that wasn't the case, and that was not the expected answer. And young men were expected to have a, a job and a career because they were going to have to go kill it, bring it home to take care of their wife and their baby. And I think that we would be blessed by celebrating that more. Yeah. Not saying this is the exclusionary track, but celebrating that track as a viable track. Yeah. And truthfully, biblically, it's the it should be the normative track. Uh, and uh, I, and the more the older I get, the more I study, the more I'm, I'm landing there. And it's something that, you know, I just, uh, I, I know that people are probably going to be offended. And we really haven't even dug wholeheartedly into the birth control discussion. No, if you I want us to do that one, time. yeah, please leave a comment and request that one, because I would love to go really hard into that. Yeah. Uh, but right now, I just like, what can we do to change our mindset yeah. to celebrate families, to prepare young people for families? This could also arrange marriage, not where you pick your kid's spouse, but maybe you work with them. And you say this is now the stage of life you're in, and let's 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 figure this out because I'm I'm dealing with so many twenty and thirty year olds that can't find a mate. Yeah, and I I feel bad for them because society has left them with very 
few choices and they don't know how to figure it out. They're trying to text like, you know, uh, proposals because they can't have a conversation face to face with a human being. Uh, you know, it, it's it's sad. Uh, and so we, we need to maybe maybe we got to do a better job of saying, you know, what worked a few generations ago isn't working anymore. Yeah. Well, you know, one thing you bring up and this is something I'm seeing in some of this stuff like, OK, the the decline, the 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 alarm that's coming on that a population decline. I've been seeing that from secular sources. Yep. Uh, this decline, by the way, and this is something that's real. I'm hearing this more from secular sources of the trend of young women who are in now their 30s plus and have realized they have gone after the career and the clock is ticking. Uh, and some of them to the point where it's too late almost to say, uh, you know, so they've gone, they've gone full career and now they find themselves empty saying, I want a family, but I, I, you know, and, and so this is stuff that I've been seeing from secular sources of them commenting on these things. And so this is not just a, this is not just a Christian alarmism kind of a thing. Like even, even people who are uh, not within our camp are realizing this is a trend that's happening now. We have sold people a bill of goods of go pursue your dreams, go pursue your career, push everything off to later. And the longer we've pushed it off, the 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 uh, the bigger the mess that we have made. Uh, and so that that's that's something to be mindful of. Um, so I do think next time we do have to hit uh, we do have to hit the birth control issue. We have to talk about that because I know people are asking. They ask. Um, you know, uh, uh, what about me? I'll, I'll say this. Maybe I'll say it like this. There's a lot of questions people want to ask in church, but they're afraid to ask it. Um, and that's why we just get into the mess that we're in because nobody wants to ask these in public. Nobody knows how to ask these questions. And so what we do is we just do what we think is right. And we do what we think other Christians think is okay. Instead of asking, what does the text teach us about these things? So I do think we have to deal with birth control. One of the next conversations, uh, are there some that we should say, yeah, nah, I going to do that. Uh, you know, some of those that say, stay away is, is all of it good. Is, is all of it bad? Uh, all of that stuff I think is worth a good discussion. Um, Last thing I want to say, just to kind of close out this idea of the blessings of children, the blessings, purpose of family. If you go to our Baptist Faith and Message as Baptists in our uh, Baptist Faith and Message 2000, it says this in the family article, marriage is uniting of one man, one woman in covenant commitment for a lifetime. It's God's unique gift to reveal the union between Christ and his church and provide for the man and the woman in marriage, the framework for intimate companionship, the channel of sexual expression, according to biblical standards and the means for procreation of the human race goes down a little bit more. And it says children from the moment of conception are a blessing and heritage from the Lord. Parents are to demonstrate to their children, God's pattern for marriage. Parents are to teach their children, spiritual and moral values and to lead them through consistent lifestyle example loving and disciplined to make choices based on biblical truth. Children are to honor and obey their parents. So that, that what we're saying is not uh, uh, new. I mean, if you're, if you're Baptist, at least you should figure this out, but what is biblical is what we really want. What's the biblical stance. And it should be to think through these things of, you know, like I said, like you had said too, the promise to be fruitful and multiply that's there. Genesis one and nine. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, the views that we should have about, you know, children being a blessing, God being over that whole process. That's, that's all stuff that we need to be mindful of. Um, and, and ask the question, if I'm willing to give my plans to the Lord in other areas, am I willing to give my plans for my family to him? Or is that one that I say, hands off, I'm going to have to control this one myself. Yeah. And it's such a significant decision that you really start to see, do you really have you decided to follow Jesus or not? You know, have you have you given him your everything? And if so, then that decision becomes a little easier. But what we find is that there's always a few things in our lives that we've we've kind of held back from the Lord. And uh, you know, uh, this is more of an issue for women than men because a lot of uh, the women uh, there's a fear, uh, there's a desire. They've been told, you know, that raising kids is hard, and you don't have your whole life just doing that, do you? You know, so th there's. Uh, there's there's a higher level of a fear i think on the part of the ladies uh, but the men there's a large fear as well because a lot of our men aren't sold out for their families they're they're looking at how much money they can have for retirement how early they can retire 
And, uh, you know, we, we get things in the right order and it changes. Now, if you want to know if God is blessing America, the birth rate tells you he is not. Hmm. Um, and, and so when you say God bless America, well, are you prepared to receive the blessing? Uh, it, it's a really important question. And, you know, uh, when you say, hey, we've had ours and we're done. OK, well, maybe that's OK. Maybe that's not. Maybe that should should or shouldn't be your call. Um, I, I think that there should always be a certain openness uh, to the Lord's plan. And if you have a surprise in your family, um, that is to be celebrated from the moment. Even if it startles you and throws you off and what are you going to do? You're going to celebrate. Stop and pray and thank the Lord for the blessing because he defined it as a blessing. Yeah. Uh, who are you to tell them otherwise? So, yeah, I think it's a good one. You know, I'm, I'm, I think I, I, I'm satisfied for where we're at. I think we've probably rattled some cages, but um, please don't, Amy. I'm, I'm trying not to be judgmental. I just want people to love children and welcome them to this world. <laughs> Let's do it. That you should. And it's not just, it's biblical, man. But, you know, I think the next conversation is going to meddle a little bit more. Uh, yeah. And it needs to be because you need to be asking, is my practice. All of us need to be asking, is what I do consistent with God's word? Or am I just, once again, phoning my decisions in, saying, yes, what other people do. I guess that's what I'll do, too. So that's all I got, man. I think it's a good discussion for a part one, for sure. Cool. All right. You want to close this out with a blessing? I would love to. So let's uh, let's close out. Uh, may the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look with favor on you and give you peace. Hey, guys, thanks for watching. Like, All subscribe, right. comment what you want to hear or questions you have on this stuff because it's good stuff to talk through. Yeah. All right. Have a good one. All righty.